Well, let's get started. Um, you know, we have um, an overwhelming amount of folks who have registered for this program, probably um, nearly 175 altogether. We know that uh, some of y'all will, will, will watch the recording. Some of y'all are here now, which is wonderful. There's so many different ways to learn. And uh, of course, uh, I think most of us find ourselves in ministry in some way. And um, of course, that means just responding to the needs of the moment. So um, if you're watching this and recording, um, beautiful. We hope you feel really fully seen, even in virtual fashion. If you're here live, uh, you're, you're most welcome. Welcome to Yale. Welcome to Yale Divinity School. Welcome to Berkeley Divinity School at Yale. I am Brandon Nappy. I am just completing my first year uh, here at Berkeley, um, though I'm a very proud YDS grad, 2001. Um, for most of the last 20 years, I've worked as a spiritual director. I've worked in retreat ministry. I've worked as a, a contemplative teacher, center and prayer teacher, mindfulness teacher. And it's um, it's an absolute blessing to be back here uh, at YDS and at, and at Berkeley. Of course, it's a, it's an amazingly exciting time to be here at YDS. You um, know, we have the Center for Public Theology and Public Policy that has launched um, uh, William Barber's uh, fantastic group that, that's uh, taken up residence here and doing really, really important work throughout the throughout the country. Um, our living village has broken ground, a wonderful new um, building um, expansion uh, project that, um, that I hope you all will keep in touch with as it unfolds over the next couple of years. Um, Berkeley is on the eve of a, a possible renovation of the Berkeley Center. So um, while we're thrilled that you have connected with us online, we hope at some point in the next a um, couple of years, you can come and visit us and um, and reconnect and and see all the the uh, the newness, the expansion. And if you've never been, um, you're a friend from a distance, and you've never been to campus. You know, we hope you'll join us. We'd love to to meet you and support you in any way um, that we can. Today's program is a collaboration um, between two offices here on the Quad, um, the Office of Transforming Leaders, which is a new office. Um, under, under my direction and the wonderful direction of Dr. Hannah Black. And um, this is a new um, commitment of Berkeley's to supporting uh, clergy leaders and lay leaders for a lifetime. We're focusing on faithful innovation. We're focusing on programming that cultivates resilience and ministry to protect against burnout. And we're just supporting um, folks who are in ministry in all the ways uh, that you need. So um, over time, we hope you'll be in touch. We hope that you'll uh, respond to surveys. We just um, want to know how we can support you best. Um, at Berkeley, we do this in three ways, through online programs like this one, through a new podcast called the Leaders Way Podcast. So, so check us out, two episodes each, mo each month. And our new Leaders Way program, which begins with six days in residence uh, at Yale each summer. Um, and then continues with seven months of online learning afterward, focusing on innovation and ministry. And so I like to think of it as, um, as summer camp for clergy. And so if you're in need of a little bit of renewal, some fellowship, some connections, some learning, and some innovation in your life, uh, applications are open. I'll throw that in the chat box for this summer's uh, Leaders Way um, program. Um, this program today is a partnership between my dear colleagues um, at the YDS Center for Continuing Education, uh, Kelly and Megan, and we're just so uh, blessed by the kind of collaboration and teamwork that, that makes um, these kinds of learning opportunities possible. So, um, Kelly, would you like to say a few words and welcome folks? Sure. Thank you so much. Um, Hello, everyone, and, and thank you for being with us today. Uh, I'd really like to thank Brandon and his team at Berkeley for their vision and work in creating this wonderful series of workshops and courses, and we're thrilled to partner with them today uh, on this offering. Angela is a friend of one of our programs from way back, so it's great to be learning with her. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Center for Continuing Education at YDS, our mission is to reach beyond the walls of the school to provide programming and resources to support individual learners, churches, and communities in engaging with the faith and furthering lifelong learning. Uh, we, too, provide a wealth of resources for those working in ministry. 
the Yale Bible Study, the Yale Youth Ministry Institute, and the YDS Summer Study are a few of our key programs. And all of the resources on our websites are available at no cost. Uh, so I encourage you to, to visit those and check those out and see if there's anything there that might be helpful to you. Uh, and to take a look at our future educational offerings. We are thrilled to be working with our, our friends at Berkeley and uh, hope that between, between our offices and our other partners here on the quad that we can just continue to provide experiences and learning opportunities that will help you in whatever you're, you're doing out there um, and to enrich and fulfill your spirit. So Brendan, thanks uh, again for letting us be part of today's workshop. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. Uh, you've always been so gracious and welcoming um, to us. And, and when I was new on the quad, um, your wisdom and insight was um, was indispensable. So thank you for all the, the amazing work that you do in your office. It's uh, it's not easy to be in ministry these days. Um, so we're really thankful for, for all the support and uh, lifelong learning that you provide. Um, let's see, um, just a, a quick housekeeping announcement, and then I think we can dive right, right in. Of course, we'll, we'll all stay on mute, though, though I know that, that um, Angela will want our, our time together to be really interactive and, and, and she'll say a few words about how, how we can best um, engage in conversation. But, but for the moment, um, please keep muted. Um, the session um, obviously is being recorded. You, you've received a note on that and we'll send out um, the recording uh, after, uh, let's say by noon tomorrow to give um, uh, Megan and myself a little time to make sure that it's in the, in the form that we want it. So um, let me introduce uh, Reverend Dr. Angela williams -Garrell. Um We're just so thankful that, that you're here with us. She's the author of, um, of two books, um, Always On, Practicing Faith in a New Media Landscape and the Gravity of Joy, the Story of Being Lost and Found. Um, Angela's research has been highlighted in the New York Times, NPR, Christianity Today, She's been in ministry for 14 plus years and teaching has been um, a big part of her vocation at Baylor and McCormick and Fuller Seminary and of course here at Yale University uh, and Yale Divinity School. Um, what I think makes uh, Reverend Dr. Gorell's speaking and ministry so powerful is she's, she's working at the intersection of joy and meaning, the life worth living, uh, the intersection of spirituality and mental health. Uh, her, her Instagram feed is is really real and inspirational. She has a beautiful podcast uh, with her sister, the Grief Sisters podcast, uh, and the Grief Sisters book club is available on Facebook. So, um, Angela, I'm just so thankful for all that you offer to the world, but especially your ministry to ministers. It's really, really um critical for us to have support like yours in these heart heart stretching times so um uh we're so thankful for your presence and we are in your wise and compassionate hands thank you for being oh, with us thank you thank you um thanks to kelly megan and brandon for hosting me today i'm really grateful and to all of you for, for joining us, it is my great hope that um, this morning, there's two things that I love to do when ministers come together, lay leaders and Christian leaders of all kinds. Um, and one is um, I'm hoping that people feel like their souls are nurtured a little bit, that they get to connect with other people that are like-minded, that are spiritual guides too. Um, and then two, uh, and, and that you feel less alone in that work. Um, and then two, that you have some space to imagine and to reflect and to really think about what's going on currently in your ministries. Um, and so that's what we're going to do together today. I'm going to give you some things to think about, and then I'd love for you all to talk about them together. Like, how does this work in our context? How are we already doing this? Or how might we do what, what she's talking about in our context? Like, what would that look like? So much of our time as clergy is spent, um, doing, 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 but having very little time to actually reflect and especially to imagine. And so that's what we want to give you a little bit of time to do today. And there's going to be a workshop online that's going to follow this one in January 2024. So next month, um, which is wild. I can't believe what year we're in people, but um, but in January, there's going to be a workshop that's going to follow this one. And so if you're feeling like and you where you're going to actually be able to really spend a week, like once a week, imagining with other clergy, um, with other lay leaders, um, 
what this looks like, what this looks like in your context, hybrid ministry. So um, I hope you'll join us in January. If today is sparking a lot for you, we're going to have more time to really dive in together and actually maybe try to implement some of the stuff that we're talking about today and test it and then come back and talk about what went poorly and what went well and, you know, keep going from there. So I became really interested in the new media landscape um, when I was a doctoral student. And I realized in 2011, I was both, um, I was a youth pastor and I was also a doctoral student. And it was, I was hanging out in the basement as one does in youth ministry um, with all the youth and smartphones started showing up in 2011 as I'm hanging out with all these youth. And I began to wonder how is, how are smartphones, how is social media impacting their relationships, their religious practices, how they see themselves, like their identity formation. And so I dedicated almost all of my papers during my doctoral studies and also my dissertation to thinking about the relationship between social media and Christian formation. And out of that dissertation came a book. My dissertation basically told me what ministers needed to help needed help with like I did a, a survey of ministers and people across the United States from 37 states over 25 denominations and I realized okay this is what people need help with and so then I wrote a book called always on for spiritual guides um and this the some of the work that we're talking about today like the workshop that we're doing today is really um drawing on some of the principles of always on but then, you know, adding the pandemic and so many other things onto it. <laughs> so much has changed. The book came out in 2019. And um, and then we went through, a you know, it was called Always On in 2019. But then like, then we were really always on a year later. So some people called me a prophet, um, which I was honored by. But uh, <laughs> I'm just uh, basically... The, you know, we we had no idea that this was going to happen and that they, we were going to actually be always on. And then I think this has dramatically shifted people's expectations in Christian communities, in church communities, and also um, then what your job description is. Um, and so we're going to talk today about doing hybrid ministry. How do we do hybrid ministry well? And when I say hybrid ministry, I mean, how do we do ministry online and in person well? So this these dual spaces, um, both spaces like moving in person to online, online to in person, doing ministry across time and space. That's what we're talking about today and again in January together. Um, <clears throat> so a major hope of mine in writing Always On was to inspire clergy to think about how to do what I call hybrid healing ministry. Hybrid healing ministry. When I look at the ministry and teachings of Jesus, what I see is someone who was a healer. And I think of all of us as like participating in that healing ministry to this day, extending Jesus's ministry. And so how do we do that in hybrid ways, both in person and online? Um, for me, uh, while this is absolutely a challenge for us, I also think that this is a time for imagination, for experimentation and for exploration. And I really do hope that as you try out different things in the coming months, um, as you continue to, and I know that you have been trying different things over the last couple of years, like thinking about ministry in new ways, I hope that you will give yourself a lot of room to experiment. And sometimes experiments, as we all learned in middle school, like sometimes science experiments fail miserably, right? And we're like, oh, that was, that didn't go well, but then that's okay. Like we learned this, like what didn't go well. Um, and then sometimes experiments really nurture a connection that we didn't imagine, you know? And so I hope that you'll see this um, hybrid ministry as a time of exp experimentation, exploration, imagination. Um, I'd love, as we're thinking about the digital landscape, um, I'd love for us to think about it as a place. Um, oftentimes when I'm training parents about how to help their teenagers uh, to think about the social media landscape, I'm like, think about it like a place so that when you ask your teenager, how was your experience at that football game? Like, who did you sit next to? What was it like? Did you enjoy yourself? Like, what happened? 
I encourage parents to ask the same things about the social media landscape with their kids. So what's it been like on TikTok lately? Who have you been connecting with? What have you seen? What's it been like? How does it make you feel? Uh, we're going to get back to that in a second. But I think if we think about the digital landscape as a place, all of us as clergy, then we can think about it as a culture that we are ministering within. And in, in some ways, that culture has some of the qualities that the United States in-person culture has, right? So there are some ways that we've taken who we are into digital landscapes. and um, But in, in many ways, that culture is different, or it has its own distinction. Um, distinctions. And so, for example, if I'm going to go minister as I have, like I've led a, a class on leadership in Kenya before, like, I, so I went and taught a class um, in Kenya, in uh, Nairobi, to be more specific. Um, and I was in Lamuru as well. And when I went, before I went to Kenya, like I read up on it, like I tried to learn about it, right? It's cultural customs. How do, what does it look like to navigate a class there? Um, and to, to prepare myself. And in some ways it was the same as teaching at Yale or at Baylor. And in other ways it was quite different. Um, and so it was important to understand how time worked, how relating worked in Kenya. I encourage you to, to think about the digital landscape in the same way, like as if you're going to a new place and like going, okay, well, what are its cultural customs? Like what, what are the practices of this landscape? Because, and I'm saying that to y'all because most of, of what my experience is, is that when the pandemic hit, is that churches primarily, when they think about hybrid ministry, record what they're doing in person and share it online. And that is not, that's not studying the landscape and then trying to minister it in it in a new way. That's just doing what we do in person and recording it for online. And so I'm encouraging all of us to say, okay, what does it mean to really understand the practices of this place? And then to minister in such a way that it attends to this, these, these cultural practices and makes sense in this landscape. Um, and I, I think really you all, what, what we're at is like a moment like the printing press. You know, the reason why this feels difficult is because when the printing press arrived, church got difficult. It was, right, like new ideas were spread around, new ways of communication were shared, and then people had to rethink about ministry in light of what was happening with the printing press. And so we're, at, we're in sort of like a reformation kind of moment um, with the church. And so if it feels uncomfortable, it, it, it is, it's uncomfortable because we're having to learn a lot. Um, in a little bit of time. But that's why we're here today. We're here to learn together, to imagine together. Um, I also, um, I'm going to give make some comments about the cultural landscape itself, and then some of the practices, just some observations from, from my perspective about the digital landscape that are important. So um, first, like the sort of moment that we find ourselves in is that we live in an information age. For centuries um, before the printing press, um, and even after it, um, but especially before it, like we lived in an information poor society, you know, and people needed to find people that could read, that could write, um, to know and to understand things. Um, they were like gathering around uh, leaders and clergy and saying like, tell us like, you know, what to think and, you know, share information with us about what's going on. We now live in an information rich society. We live at a time when we can pretty much know anything. Chat GPT, you know, being one of those ways, Google. Um, in general, we experience information overload. So every day we are invited through email, social media platforms, news headlines, uh, you know, so many different outlets to take in copious amounts of information. So we are rich in information. We are poor in theological reflection and discernment. We need faith leaders like you who will create space for discernment, who will help us to develop intellectual humility, who will cultivate the Christian practice of truth-telling, affirming what is good and true in the world. We also live in a connected age. Right? So we live in an information age and a connected age. 
We can find basically anyone we have ever known on the internet. <laughs> we can stay connected to people we knew in middle school, people we met in Kenya on a trip, people we were introduced to at a work party. We are rich in networking. We are poor in mentorship, deep listening, articulating uh, our testimony or testimonies and stories about God's activity. We are poor in spaces that invite vulnerability, spaces that are shame-free, spaces where we invite questions, mistakes, failures. We also finally live in a mentally distressed age. No one is surprised by anything that I'm saying about information, <laughs> connect, connection, networking, and now mentally distressed age. Too many people, especially in the United States, especially young adults in the United States are overwhelmed with anxiety, depression, and despair. We are rich in worry. We are rich in conflict, stress, grief, striving, entertainment, and insomnia. We are poor in spiritual attunement, in space for silence, in contentment, peace, true presence, rest, healing, joy. I wonder, as you're listening this morning, how might we be the kind of faith leaders that create space, that create programming, that create worship services, that create small groups, Bible study, opportunities for people to be nurtured in the ways that we are poor, in the things that we are poor in. So instead of giving people more things to think about, instead of giving people more information, um, how might we give space for these things that people so desperately need? How, how might we minister to the poverty of our time in a hybrid way? So what do people expect in a new media culture? One of the most interesting and fundamental characteristics of the new media landscape is that it has been called a participatory culture. So if we're thinking about it as a space, as a culture in itself, it's been called a participatory culture. USC professor and communications uh, director, uh, Henry Jenkins coined this term in his first book in 1992 about the new media landscape. Um, so we weren't calling it the new media landscape at that time, but he was noticing right away, this is a participatory culture. And so Jenkins defined the characteristics of participatory culture online, specifically noting that it has dynamic, interactive qualities. And these qualities are that it is, um, first, it has active and communal engagement. In the new media landscape, everyone can have a voice. Everyone can share their perspective, assess, critique, contribute, right? It is dynamic. It's consistently changing. It's one to many um, in conversation and it's people join in. It's a place where people, um, there's very low barriers to participation, very low barriers. It is also a place where people create. It's a place where people share their perspectives, their creations. It's a place where people are easily mentored, where there's very low barriers to mentorship. So when you look at YouTube or you look at gaming, this is what I'm thinking about is that you can find people who can teach you things um, without even having to pay them for it or um, having to even um, know them very well. So mentorship um, and then relationship and belonging is right is it's very much a part of the new media landscape like wherever you are um you can or whoever you are you can find places of belonging and relationship and it's also a place where people expect um on the regular to be inspired if they're going to spend time in certain spaces a lot of times the reason why they spend time there is because they're inspired in some way so i would love for all of you to get into breakouts and to just digest together a little bit of what I've shared so far. Um, 
from my perspective, we are um, when we are creating digital experiences, these are qualities that we want to focus on and integrate. And so I'm wondering if we could all get together in breakouts and talk about what does it look like in designing worship services and other types of communal experiences to invite people into meaningful action and reflection, dialogue, creation, and mentoring relationships. Um, and these things could happen both asynchronously or um, you know, at all different times, people doing these sorts of things that we might imagine together or at the same time like we are right now. We're in a synchronous um, experience right now. Those of us who are actually on right now, those of us who are listening later, you're in an ace, you're doing this asynchronously, right? And so how might you integrate one of the values? This is what I would love for y'all to talk about together. How might you integrate one of the values of participatory culture into your hybrid ministry, either in a new way or a deeper way? And you could also talk a little bit about the poverty of our time and how that connects um, to the poverty of our time as well. Um, okay, welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Um, so in a minute, well, I'm going to, so after the second breakout, then we'll do some large group uh, conversation. Um, but the second, so the first thing that I'm inviting you to think about, you know, so far is, okay, Let's think about this new media landscape as a place with particular practices. How do we nurture those practices in meaningful ways in order to participate in people's healing? How do we interact in this culture in ways that make sense in this landscape? The second thing that I'm inviting us to think about today is what I call hybrid pastoral care. <laughs> hybrid pastoral care. Um, Part of ministry in a new media landscape includes ministering to people's social media and other types of new media experiences. And I'm using the word uh, new media or the phrase new media to like to talk about every diff like so it's both new media includes social media, but also practices like blogging and sharing and posting and all that language, all those new actions that we do because of new media. It includes devices, iPads, smartphones, laptops. It's streaming, you know, Netflix, Hulu, mm -hmm. all the many different um, things that you um, need to, uh, like all the different things you pay for now to watch TV, you know, although um, it includes Google Maps, apps on your phone. So new media is all encompassing. Um, and then social media is what, you know, are the platforms we use specifically to connect with other people. Um, but so hybrid ministry is not just doing ministry in, in um, online and in person or through mediated communication, like through email, through texting, et cetera, but it's also ministering to people's experiences online and as they use new media. And so um, given that new media experiences can nurture everything from joy to anxiety, depression to hope, loneliness and connection, anger and empathy, and social media platforms can be spaces where our congregants are liked and ignored. Um, our community needs to be a space, I think, where people can share what is happening online and have conversations with you about their new media experiences. Um, I think that we need to ask people about their new media experiences, just like we ask them about other aspects of their lives. And that's what I was hinting at a few moments ago when I was talking about teenagers. We might ask them about TikTok or, or Snapchat or Instagram if they're a little bit older, like a lot of young adults like Instagram more than those things, but younger kids tend to like TikTok and Snapchat the best. Um, but I think it's important to also ask adults about their new media experiences on Facebook, on Instagram, as they read their news online, et cetera. And so I encourage you to encourage your congregants to share stories about their new media and hybrid living experiences. Um, and so this requires asking what I like to call uh, question, uh, curious, compelling, capacious questions. And so um, these are the most kind of like powerful kind of questions for me. Curious questions are questions that don't assume people's experience. They literally are curious, like what is your experience? Instead of just assuming that everyone's experience is like ours, um, it's really trying to be curious about how have you experienced this landscape um, being in these spaces? 
it's also their compelling questions are questions that people really want to answer because they're about their lives. And then capacious questions are roomy questions, questions that uh, create space for everybody's experiences, questions like these. And I'm going to put them right in to the chat. So questions like, when have you had a joyful experience online? Describe a time when you felt heard, affirmed, or understood online. Or how does social media help you to love God and others? On the other hand, how does it prevent you from loving God or loving others? When have you had a painful experience online? Describe a time when you felt unheard, bullied, left out, or misunderstood online. What are your top three feelings you experience when using social media? And why do you think this is so? Um, I've done this, like these sorts of questions, you can have people turn toward each other and talk about um, in it, like during the middle of a worship service, if you're talking about what it's like to live in a hybrid landscape, to live in these new media spaces and have people turn to each other and answer questions like these. You could also, I've done um, like Survey Monkey where I have everybody use their phones for the feelings question, like what's one feeling you feel online and have everybody answer it. And then it creates a word cloud behind me and you immediately know what several hundred people in the room think. And then we all have a conversation together about the word cloud. Um, have you ever disagreed with someone or had someone disagree with you on a social media platform or through a technological device? <laughs> what happened? Again, it's capacious, right? So it's not assuming that something bad happened or something good happened or that it was easy or that it was hard, but it's like, what was this like for you? Have you ever gotten really angry while using social media? What happened? Why? What happened? Um, all of these, these kinds of questions do multiple things for congregants, for people in our communities. One, it invites theological and critical reflection on their experiences in the new media landscape. The number one thing, the number one thing that my survey for my dissertation demonstrated was the very little bit of theological or critical reflection that was going on related to the new media landscape. One of the questions in my survey was, how does social media help you to love God and or love others? The number one thing that people said, the first thing they said, it was an open-ended question, was always, I've never thought about this before. That was the most common thing that people said. And so first, it's really inviting people into like, where is God in this landscape? Where is God in your life? And, um, and then also, where does your faith come into how you are in this space? How does it impact the way that you interact with other people? And then um, the other thing that it does is it provides opportunities for us to minister to people where they are at. We don't know what people are going through. Y'all already know this, right? You're like, you've been clergy for a long time. You've been spiritual guides for a long time. You know, unless I ask somebody, I don't know what's going on in their life. And so for some of us, um, like we don't know to talk about what's happened on Facebook with other people. We might talk to like our partner or a good friend about it, but we don't know to necessarily talk to a clergy person about this really difficult experience or this way of like navigating the new media landscape, you know, but people are stressed about it. It's hard. It's an aspect of their lives that I think they need ministering. Um, they need your ministry in the midst of. And so <clears throat> the next breakout question and, um, Brandon's going to post it um, right now in the chat, and then we're going to also broadcast it to everybody, is have you ministered to the social media experiences of congregants? So um, you could also say new media experiences if you want to go broader than just social media, but have you taken time to listen to people's experiences with new media in your community? If so, what has this looked like? So help other people around you that maybe haven't had this opportunity yet. Like they don't, they haven't thought much about this yet or done this. So if you've done this a lot, what does this look like? And if you haven't, and how has it gone? Um, what have you learned? If not, if this hasn't been at the forefront of your mind, what might this look like in the context that you work in and volunteer and lead in? We're gonna head to breakouts again. All right, everybody coming back together again. This is good.
All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, if you could please make sure you're muted. Thank you so much. Um, if you would like, um, I would love to hear from a few of you about your observations from the last two small groups. So if someone had an interesting idea, something that they're doing that you would like to share, or someone just had an, an interesting idea that they haven't done yet, but like that you would like to share, or if you have a question for me that um, maybe I can answer, um, you could put an X, just put an X into the chat and then um, I'll call your name. Um, if you have a question or a reflection from your breakouts, would I welcome them right now. Hi, Janet, please go ahead. Hello, um, I am curious about control. Um, when we go to church physically, kind of once you're there, um, you have to at least look like you're paying attention. It's kind of a high demand um, thing continuously, relationally, continuously for an hour or more, um, typically on a Sunday morning. Um, if you're online at home, you have control. You can get up and get a cup of coffee. You can roam around. You can silence the hymn you don't like. Um, so I'm just curious about that aspect of um, hybrid ministry and what, if anything, you've discovered about that. Mm -hmm. um, so the more interested people are in what you're doing, um, the more that they pay attention and they engage, I think. And also, and so I do think there's one aspect of it like that, which is like, we pay attention in the new media landscape to the things that we're drawn to, that inspire us, that we want to learn, the people we want to connect with. So part of the new media landscape is relinquish, relinquishing control. It is these low, like, so there's low barriers to participation. There's low barriers to who gets to say what the truth is. There's low barriers to who gets to lead things, um, who gets to be interesting, you know? And so in some ways we are relinquishing control that we've normally had in physical in-person spaces. Um, so that is, I think, part of the culture is extemporaneous, spontaneous, um, allowing of like things to unfold. <laughs> and so I would, I would say that um, ministry in, in, in digital spaces is more akin to like small group ministry, where maybe you train some leaders and then they like talk in groups, but then, you know, the prompts could take the group over the course of an hour in many different directions. And every sort of group has a different experience. I think that's what uh, we have to think more about digital ministry in that way, like as been more of like a worship service where everyone's experience is pretty similar as far as like how they participate, what it looks like. Um, but then, I, and so I think on the one hand, what's difficult about that is like, sure, some people don't participate. Some people leave their screen on, but they're not actually here. They're not, they're going to get coffee. They're going to go talk to somebody else. They're not really doing the dynamic interactive stuff. But then the, the good thing about it is that there's these things that can unfold and happen in that interactivity, in that participation that we didn't anticipate. So I think there's some space for people to contribute in ways that they don't in worship services um, and, you know, like in in-person worship services as they are right now. Um, but I do think that that's something that we want to think together more about um, because I, I, the expectation because of the pandemic for most of us when we go to a, when we watch a worship service online the expectation is i don't have to participate if i don't want to so if we want people to participate we actually have to change that expectation and so that's something for all of us to talk about how do we change and so um each week I'm doing four concepts today. The first was participatory culture. The second was hybrid pastoral care. In January, when we do the workshop, we're gonna have a couple hours each week dedicated to each thing. So we'll be thinking together about participatory culture. Why are people getting online and wanting to participate in the new media landscape, but then getting on into our worship services and not wanting to? How do we shift those expectations? What might that look like? to encourage more participation. We're gonna dream about that together. Um, I think it really takes some imagination on our parts. 
we need to figure that, you know, but in January, I'm going to give some concrete examples for each one of the practices to each week of churches that are doing these things in what I think are interesting ways. Um, thank you for your question. Someone else, reflection or question? We had one thought in the chat, Angela. Did you see that? Yes, from now I, I am just now. Thank you so much. Um, I don't see that. It, yeah. Right. I think, yeah. Um, inclusiveness. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have to think about older adults, people with disabilities. If we're wanting people to participate and interact together, how do we do this in ways that are inclusive of people of differing abilities? Um, and people who are older. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, Kimberly's talking about um, letting people find benefits that are different from what we expect and letting that be okay. Absolutely. Yeah, as ministry, as ministers, we know that sometimes we imagine certain things for people, but part of that imagining might be allowing them to get whatever benefits they want from it. Yeah. All right, we'll we'll move on, but I'll give you another opportunity um, in a little while to respond um, and or ask questions. The next principle that we're going to talk about is hybrid Christian practices. And um, the reason for this is that uh, the definition of community, and I'm putting it into the chat, is that community is shared resources, a shared identity or identities, shared support, and shared practices. This is what makes a community a community, is that you have a sense of these things with people. And so if I'm participating online in your church or in your ministry, um, but I don't have a sense of one or more of these things, then I'm not really a part of your community. And so one of the things I want to think about in the next few minutes together is how do we cultivate a sense of shared practices um, with our people? Um, and um, especially our digital community that might be joining us online, um, really it comes down to that we have to like teach about shared Christian practices. And Christians have historic Christian practices that we have engaged in for centuries, but sometimes um, people of faith like don't have a way, like they don't really know how to articulate this. And so um, I love Dorothy Bass's work on Christian practices. She's done rich work um, for a couple of decades on this and has gotten a lot of other people to join in that work. Um, Christine Pohl's book, Living Into Community, walks through uh, four Christian practices and I think really helpful uh, ways. And so um, what I'm encouraging us to do today is to uh, teach historic Christian practices such as, these are just a few that we could name, prayer, gratitude, hospitality, listening, fasting, celebrating, lamenting, simplicity, peace building, to teach these things in hybrid ways. And so, um, because sometimes we might not know as people of faith, oh, when you're talking about hospitality in your sermon, in this small group, in this Bible study, you mean online too. <laughs> you mean on Facebook, you mean in, in on Instagram, you mean as I'm using new media devices of all different kinds. When you're talking about practicing my faith, you mean in the new media landscape too. And so, for example, if I'm going to teach Romans 12, 15, which is like that we are to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn, to rejoice together, to lament together, I might talk about it. Um, I might do it in like three different ways when I'm teaching this practice. So first I might say, you know, what does it look like in your in-person interactions? And I might even use that language with people in your in-person everyday interactions with people at the grocery store, when you're having dinner with people in their home, um, you know, when you're, you're connecting with a friend or with family, like, what does it look like for you to rejoice with people who are rejoicing? When something wonderful happens to someone else, what does it look like to join in their rejoicing for you in person? How do you do that when you're sitting at dinner with them? And you might give some examples of what that looks like. Um, but then during the actual worship service, I could also actually give people an opportunity to rejoice, for example, with one another. I know a church, St. John's Cathedral, once a month here in Los Angeles, they invite everyone to the front. It's an Episcopal church here. 
They, they, they invite everyone to the front once a month and they say, if you are rejoicing about something, come on down. It's like the price is right, y'all. And they like, people do. They, they come down and they gather together around and the, the, the rector goes to each person and says, what are you rejoicing over today? And they go down the line and it's like, I'm in remission from cancer. We rejoice with you. I just got a new job. We rejoice with you. My child just graduated. We rejoice with you. And it is like, it fills the space with joy because you cannot help but to be filled up by what is happening you know and I could imagine that then you could say also those of you online like Vicky is saying where you greet the people who are with you online both at the beginning at the end all throughout the service you're saying okay if you have something to rejoice with uh, with us about please put it in the chat tell us we want to rejoice with you and then maybe you have someone who or text this number Maybe even like maybe you have the the cell phone up there with you and you get some text from people. OK, we rejoice with you about this, Kelly. Like we're so glad, you know, and you're doing this. So in person, across in a hybrid way and online at the same time rejoicing. OK, well, then and you could do some sim similar with laments. Right. Um, but then online. How might you help people to think about rejoicing and mourning Romans 12, 15 online? Well, at the same time, so you're, you're talking about it in person, how they, what it looks like. You're doing it in a hybrid way. Actually, you're practicing it together during the worship service. But also you could encourage people this next week, as you get on Facebook, as you get on Instagram, as you get on Snapchat, look for people to rejoice and mourn with. I invite that to be the glasses that you go into this landscape with this next week. When you get online, who might you be overjoyed with? And do it in a really intentional way. Like I encourage you not just to put an emoji, like you love it or you like it, but actually reply to that person. Hey, I'm really excited for you about this thing. Like I'm overjoyed that this happened to you or maybe share their post and ask other people you know like that's really rejoicing is like you make somebody else's stuff your stuff right or you message them you do give them a direct message what's called a dm like you dm this person and you tell them in a really intentional way hey i saw this post that you had and i wanted to tell you how excited i am for you how i'm celebrating with you or i saw this post and um about your dad's passing. Like one of my friends, her dad passed away yesterday. And I wanted to take a moment to, to message you and to tell you that my heart is breaking with you. It aches with you. This is such a tender loss. You know, it's that extra thing that we're doing that we're, and here's one of the things you all is that when I go into the new media landscape with these kinds of glasses, when this is what I'm looking for, it makes me, it makes it much less likely that I'm going to go in and be obsessed with how people are responding to me, be obsessed with how many likes I'm getting on this certain post or how many followers or, or that I'm going to get consumed in other kinds of, of media scrolling. I'm going to come back to this in January. I, I wish you all, when I teach this, it does, it takes a long time because this is a new culture. There's so many different things um, that I could say about it. And so I'm just like dipping my like pinky toe in with you all today. Um, but participating online has been shown to increase connection and to help people to feel less alone in their lives. But passive scrolling, passively scrolling for copious amounts of time, never replying to people, never DMing people, never posting, never sharing, creating a creation and sharing has been led, leads to depression, anxiety, jealousy, feeling less happy about our lives. So the more we participate in the landscape, the more we talk to other people when we enter into the landscape and connect with them, the less alone we feel and the more it contributes to our mental and spiritual well-being versus otherwise. So by teaching them how to rejoice and mourn with people in a new media landscape in very concrete, intentional ways, you're also nurturing their mental and spiritual well-being as they experience this landscape. Um, so we're going to jump back into breakouts again. I'd love for y'all to talk together about what do you think about teaching Christian practices and spiritual disciplines in hybrid terms? If you have done this, what is one example from your ministry? And if not, what might this look like for you? Teaching hybrid Christian practices or teaching Christian practices in hybrid ways.
All right, everyone, we're coming back together. <clears throat> um, please, don't forget, please don't forget to mute yourselves. I know you've been on chatting it up with each other. I'm so glad. Um, okay, so we've talked so far about three principles of, of like hybrid ministry, doing hybrid healing ministry. And so the first is understanding the new media landscape and incorporating some of its practices its ways of of existing in the world into our ministry practices that are thinking theologically, thinking critically about what it looks like to be a part of this culture, to do ministry in this particular kind of culture, a participatory culture. Um, the second thing that we talked about together was hybrid pastoral care. How do we minister to people's online and mediated experiences? And then the third thing that we were just talking about is how do we teach historic Christian practices that are the things that help us to actually live out our faith in hybrid ways and do them in hybrid ways. The last thing, the last principle, and I can't believe we're already on the last principle, it's flown by, um, but is um, is doing is hybrid ministry thinking where you're going back and forth across from in-person to online, online to in-person and immersive digital experiences. So I'm gonna give some concrete examples of hybrid ministry thinking. So this is being very intentional about how you're um, connecting, integrating online and in person with people, helping people to, um, yes, okay. So <clears throat> the first example is going from in person to online. So one way of engaging in hybrid ministry thinking is creating ways for people to do in person activities that they then come together in some type of digital space to reflect on, share, talk about. And so it's moving from the in-person experience to a gathered digital experience. Um, so for example, say you wanna teach hospitality. And like I said, uh, Christine Pohl, Living Into Community, her book, she was a Christian ethicist, she passed away recently. In her book, Living Into Community, she talks extensively about this historic practice of hospitality, what it is, what it looks like. So say you're going, you know what, in our community, we really wanna focus on hospitality for the month of December into here, you know, okay? So we're gonna look at what does it look like to be people who practice, who live about hospitality. So maybe on Sunday morning, you're in person with everybody in a worship service, and maybe people are joining you online as well. And you explain this historic practice of hospitality. You have people talk about how they've done it in their lives, how they'd like to do it differently, that sort of thing. And then you give everyone a prompt and you say, I would love for you in the next two weeks to invite one of your neighbors that you don't know on your street to have a meal or coffee with you or dessert. Like you, um, you know, and it could be something that you buy or something that you make yourself. And you just try to, you extend hospitality to a stranger in this next couple of weeks. And so you can meet them out in public and have coffee with, or you could have them in your home, whatever you feel most comfortable doing. And then we're gonna get together and you could either, you could pick an online platform that makes sense for your community, or you could have a couple of different ones. Um, maybe it's Zoom and you say at, at Zoom, we're gonna get on Zoom at these different times over the next couple of weeks and whatever time works for you. I would love to hear, sorry, if, if you're giving people a two week time period, you would say, two weeks late, we're going to get on Zoom in a few weeks and we're going to share how it went. And I would love to know if it went poorly, if you crashed and burned, if you asked three people and no one said yes to you, or, you know, you got together and it was awkward. We're going to talk about that. If you got together and it went really beautifully and you got to new, you know, we're going to talk about that too. And so you could give people multiple opportunities to meet with you over the course of a week, whatever time worked for them, and they could share together their experiences of meeting with the this person in person. You could also do a group me thread for people who can't meet on Zoom, or you could do either or. Group me is a very easy way of, you could just um, have uh, everybody download the app. They could use it through um, their email as well. So older adults in your church, if you, um, Get, do a little training on GroupMe. It's very easy to use. It's texting. It's basically texting, but instead of filling up people's regular inbox, it's a particular app that they're using, but they can share their experiences through GroupMe 
about what happened in person. And so that's a way of going from in-person experiences into an online shared dynamic interactive experience. And you're teaching this practice across a number of weeks. Um, another example of hybrid ministry thinking is di immersive digital experiences. So for example, you could get online with people um, in, in a number of platforms, but you like, like Zoom is probably the, the easiest um, that all of us are very familiar with, like this one right now. And you could lead people in Lectio Divina. And so you are looking at a text together. You have somebody read it out loud. You know, you, maybe you even pick them ahead of time. Someone reads it once, and then you give people questions to reflect upon each time, right? So a question like, what's a word um, that or a phrase that stands out to you? You read it again, you know, give some silence, read it again. And then you ask a question like, what question comes up for you as you read this text? You read it again. And then you ask a question like, what is God prompting in you as you listen to this text? What's coming up for you in your life? And give some silence. And then you all talk together. That's an immersive digital experience. It's interactive. It's not um, difficult. Um, it's engaging. It allows for the spirit of God to speak people in, you know, speak to people, imaginative prayer. There's another way, you know, I will walk through that another day, but imaginative prayer is another way of doing a digital immersive experience with one another. Um, if you want to see an example of people who lead people in guided meditation um, really well, I would uh, offer to you the Center for Spiritual Imagination in New York City, the Center for Spiritual Imagination. Um, they do um, online meditation every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern time, um, and it's free for people to join and be a part of. And so you could see Adam there often is usually the person who leads on Tuesdays uh, guided meditation. That's an immersive digital experience. Um, also, another example, I, uh, there's a church in New Haven, Connecticut, Elm City Vineyard, that for a time was meeting at 846 for prayer. Um, 846 is what they called it. And every day at 846 a.m. and 846 p.m. for a time, you could jump online and somebody from the prayer team at Elm City Vineyard was there to pray with people. Um, immersive digital experience. Um, and now the, the third example I'll give is you could host um, a dinner party on Zoom where someone gives everybody a recipe to follow and everyone makes it together. <laughs> and then um, and then you could have a number of questions that people can talk to one another about. So say, for example, that you want to talk about the great outdoors, you could have during this immersive dinner, dinner party experience on Zoom, have people stop as they're eating, have people um, share answers to different questions, like when have you felt peace in nature? When have you experienced God's presence in nature? How has the natural world been a way of connecting to God for you? If it hasn't been, what kind of place helps you to sense God's presence? So you have a sort of immersive digital dinner experience um, so these are three examples of, of that. The next, uh, the final way of engaging in hybrid ministry thinking is then moving from digital interaction to in-person experiences or in-person gatherings. So for example, a church in Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, they uh, put on Facebook, um, they decided to advertise for their church on Facebook that they were willing to pray with anybody about anything. And they literally, and so what they were able to do with their Facebook ads was to make sure that it was the ads were only going to people who live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. That's a possibility. You can actually buy Facebook ads. They, they, they dedicated some of their church budget to Facebook ads, and they decided to target only people who live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And they said, um, if you would like someone to pray with you over the phone, um, text this number. They um, had a prayer team who was attending to this number on a daily basis, like someone every single day um, had this number, and um, they set it up digitally. Um, and so, you you know, it would take a little bit of tech savvy, but there's some tech savvy people in every community. Um, and so when whoever got this number for that day, um, they would, uh, whoever got a text from somebody um, from that day would then pray with the person on, on Facebook that, you know, had reached out to them and they would do it initially through text. Um, you know, what would you like prayer about? 
and then they would like write them a prayer or they would voice text them a prayer. Well, then um, they went a step further and they said the prayer team was prompted. They were trained in how to do this. And they said, if you would like me to call you and pray for you over the phone, I will. Um, if the person wanted prayer over the phone, they they um, and many people took them up on it. They pray, called them and prayed for them. If they didn't take them up on it, they went to the, to the final step. But or if they took them up on like talking to them on the phone, they went to the final step at the end of the prayer. They said, "Hey, we meet at this place in Albuquerque every Sunday morning at this time for church together. I'd love to meet you at the front door if any day you would like." to come to our church, let me know. Text this number, say you talk to Angela, and that, and I will meet you at the front door um, on this Sunday morning that you wanna come. You all, tons of people came. 30% of the people who they prayed for came and visited their church. Because someone said, I will meet you at the front door, and they were somebody who had prayed for them, they were willing to then come to the church. It's an incredible way, I think, of using technology, digital experiences to then a mediated experience into the online experience and nurturing community with each other. I only say that not to say like, you need to do this kind of prayer ministry right now, but to, to spark your imagination and to say like, what does it look like to connect with people in um, the digital landscape and then encourage that in-person connection with them? So we're gonna do one final breakout together, another eight minutes. I would love for you all to talk together about one example of each of the things that I'm talking about. Can you come up and do as many as you can? Maybe you only get through one of them, but what's one example of an in-person to online experience that you can think of that you've done or that could be interesting in your community, one example of a digital immersive experience and one example of an online to in-person experience. Maybe choose one or two, try to get through all of them if you can. Okay, everyone, welcome back. Um, Brandon has actually just put a link to my workshop that's in January. That's a four week version of what we're doing today, where we're going to actually get to get lots more rich examples of each one of these things and spend dive into each one for a couple hours a week. And we're actually um, going to imagine some experiments and then go experiment with your people. And then we'll come back and talk about it the following week. Um, mm. And so if you'd like to actually do some exploration um, experimentation, imagination in a really intentional way together around each one of these things, please join us in January. Um, like I said, I've been in ministry myself 14 years as a pastor uh, before teaching in the academy. I know that you don't get a lot of time to reflect and imagine. You spend a lot of your time just doing ministry, but this is an opportunity to really um, think together about how to do these things, um, some of these things well, differently, better, um, in new ways, um, in deeper ways, that sort of thing. And so, um, uh, yeah, thank you so much, um, Tammy, for your question and Hannah for answering it. Um, if you have a reflection on anything that's been talked about in the last two hours or a question for me, please put an X in the chat. I love to hear your illuminations. Like, this is the thing, this, this is what I'm going to be thinking about the rest of today, or um, this particular thing is weighing on me, or what about this? So please, um, if you have a reflection or a question, um, I'd love to hear it. I know it will benefit the community too. Dawn, hi, thank you. Yeah, hi. I was going to say, I think one of the things that you're actually demonstrating and that we can do more and that I've been experimenting with too, is the fact that you're sharing resources. You're coming to us from Berkeley, but I found out about this from Yale, you know, like, and this is all melding together, but it really calls into question and the United Church of Christ, right, about autonomy and how we all stay separate. And we were talking about in our group, how that's part of things falling down. And what does that mean? And one of the people in our group is from an area where where people are half time basically. And so what does that mean about church connection and when you can leave and how you stay connected? And so there's so many outcomes from that that need to be taken into account in a really positive way. So I thank you for that. And I hope we are all more and more open to how we connect and how it's helpful to let those walls fall. 
Oh my gosh. So yes, I love that you're bringing this up. I'm so grateful. I'm actually making a note to myself. Um, okay. Thank you so much, Don. because one of the most powerful things that I saw in my community, I was living in Waco, Texas at the time when the pandemic hit and I was working at Baylor. I no longer work at Baylor. Um, I've been just doing speaking and consulting and writing. Um, but one of the most interesting things that happened is that four pastors from four different churches got together and did their online worship services together. And one, it was really like they were able to actually, they had more space for imagination because they weren't having to do one service like them, they were doing one service every four weeks, basically, right, that they were in charge of, and then the other three helped with, like, why don't we, like, what does it look like to do hybrid ministry in meaningful ways together? I love this question, and not just with other churches, absolutely, but partnering with other ministry, I mean, other, um, I'm sorry, nonprofits in your community, saying, like, what would it look like to partner with this group or with that group, and to actually put on, you know, to do this service or this small group or this um, experience in our community partnering with these other organizations and really seeing us as a team and so instead of seeing all just the pastors the rectors on your team the priest on your team as your church people what would it look like to be like we're the priest of this parish literally parish like we go back to that neighborhood sense of like this is our neighborhood all of us our church leaders for this particular neighborhood, what does it look like to do hybrid ministry together? Because when we work together, not only are we smarter, literally co collective intelligence is a thing, but also we work less. We, we, we don't have to work as hard when we work with other people. Um, if initially it might feel like more work, but over time it becomes less work. Also, the last thing I'll say about this is that the more interactive your worship services are, the less you have to be brilliant and amazing every week. I don't know about y'all, but I only got a really good sermon in me. Like I've got like four good sermons a year in me, <laughs> like that really knock it out of the park where I'm saying something new for myself or that I think is really, you know, but when we, so when we allow worship services to be around imaginative prayer, Lectio Divina, engaging with one another, we don't have to spend 20 minutes being the smartest, most brilliant, most interesting person in the room. So like, what does it look like to shift our idea of homilies too? You know, so, okay. Um, yes, Debbie, what are you thinking? Oh, I was just asking what it was like at Baylor, but that can be an offline conversation. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. I thought it's no, a I you can ignore that. Life. You can yes. ignore it. Yeah, I want to share with everybody. This is um, I'm at Angela Gorell on Instagram. I'm also on Facebook, Angela Williams Gorell. Be friends with me. I would love it. Um, and then this is my website, angelagorell.com. If you go to my website, you can send me an email direct. That like there's a contact thing at form at the bottom. It goes straight to my email inbox. So if you want to email with me, if you want to reach out to me on Instagram or, or Facebook, please feel free to do that. Anybody else have a, a thought or a question before we close? Okay, before, um, since no one else has a thought, thank you so much for what you're saying. I'm just going to pray for you to close us out. Um, God, thank you so much for each person in this digital space, for each person who has joined us from other countries, from other states in the United States, from across the United States, from across the world. God, I thank you for these leaders, for their hearts, for caring about other people. God, as they move toward the Advent, give them strength give them guidance, sustain them, help them to have the peace that passes all understanding. Anyone who is grieving in this space today, would you comfort them with the comfort that only you can bring? Would you help other people to support them in the ways that they need to be supported, even as they are clergy and spiritual guides themselves? God, we pray for us to feel your presence as we prepare our sermons, our worship services, our small groups, our Bible studies for the coming weeks, God, would you guide us? Would your wisdom nour nourish us? Would you nurture our imaginations? God, we want to join with you in what you're doing. And we think of so many places around the world that are experiencing difficulty, strife, war today. We think of Ukraine and Syria. We think of Sudan. We think of Israel, Palestine, Gaza, West Bank, Lebanon. God, we lift up these places to you, Lord. Have mercy. 
have mercy, have mercy on each one of us on these places around the world. God, we thank you for your faithfulness, for your mercy, for your compassion, for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace. Thank you, friends. Thanks for being with me. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for learning together. Angela, thank you for sharing your gifts and be assured of our prayers as, as you uh, minister to so many ministers and clergy around the world. Um, we're so grateful to you and all you do.